It was a mistake heading out that morning, but hindsight always gives you 20-20 vision. Anyway, my name's Boone Jensen, and back in 2005 I decided to leave the grid. Thought I'd go off and find some peace in a patch of land out in Montana. No phone, no internet, just me, a cabin I built with my own two hands and enough supplies to last a man a good long while. You see, I grew up in the city, Cleveland of all places, and I hated every minute of it. The noise, the traffic, the people always rushing like they had somewhere more important to be. So, at the age of 35, I said goodbye to the concrete jungle and moved into the wilderness. I didn't come here unprepared either. Spent years saving money, buying land, and reading every survival guide I could get my hands on. It was great at first. Quiet mornings with just the sound of birds and wind through the trees. Afternoons spent chopping wood or fishing, and long nights around the fire, thinking about how lucky I was. I had one neighbor, and by neighbor I mean the closest human lived about 15 miles away. His name was Paul Coombs, a crusty old Vietnam vet who settled out here in the 80s. We'd occasionally help each other out, but mostly we kept to ourselves. Now, on this particular day, I was heading down to Paul's to borrow a tool he had, an auger for drilling fence post holes. Needed to fix up the boundary fence on my property. I didn't drive there, no point really. Walking through the woods was part of the reason I came here. That and the fact gas was expensive, and my old pickup wasn't what you'd call reliable. The path between our places was simple well-worn and familiar to me by that point. So, when I started hearing noises off the trail about halfway through, I assumed it was just wildlife. You get used to deer, elk, and even the occasional black bear. I kept moving, didn't give it much thought. About a quarter mile later, I saw something ahead. A lump, dark, motionless. It wasn't moving. I figured it was a dead animal at first, maybe hit by a passing hunter or something. But as I got closer, it wasn't an animal. It was a man. I stopped dead in my tracks. The guy was sprawled out like he'd been dropped there, limbs splayed awkwardly. He wore old hiking boots and a heavy jacket, but something wasn't right. There was no backpack, no gear, nothing a regular hiker would carry out here. Hell, you'd be stupid to come this deep into the woods without being prepared. I walked closer, cautious. The smell hit me first, sickly sweet like rotting meat. He had been dead for at least a few days. Flies buzzed around him, and there was something off about his face. His eyes were gone. Not gouged out, not scratched away, just gone, like someone had scooped them out cleanly. That's when I noticed his chest. Whatever had killed him had left a series of deep, ragged wounds across his torso. They weren't clean cuts like a knife would make. It was more like something had raked him, something with claws. The sight of it made me feel sick, but I'd seen dead things before just not people. I crouched down to get a better look. He wasn't someone I knew from town, and I sure as hell hadn't heard of any hikers going missing recently. I stood up, unsure of what to do. Normally I'd go to Paul, but Paul was another 15 minutes away, and I wasn't eager to leave this guy out here like that. There was something unsettling about the whole thing, like the forest was suddenly too quiet, as if it were watching me. I pulled out my pocket knife, useless against whatever did this, but it made me feel better. I started walking backward, keeping an eye on the body until it was out of sight, and then I turned and bolted down the path toward Paul's. When I got to his place, I banged on the door like a madman. Paul opened it, shotgun in hand, looking like he'd just woken up from a nap. His grizzled face twisted into a frown when he saw me. What the hell, Boone? There's a dead guy in the woods, I blurted, no point beating around the bush. He stared at me squinting like he was trying to figure out if I was pulling his leg. But the look on my face must have told him I wasn't joking. Where? he asked, grabbing his coat and stepping out onto his porch. Halfway between here and my place, I said, catching my breath. He's been mauled or something, his chest, his eyes. I don't know what the hell happened. Paul didn't waste time asking more questions. He loaded his shotgun and motioned for me to lead the way. As we walked... I explained everything I saw. He stayed quiet, just nodding along, the way a man who's seen too much does. That was the thing about Paul. He'd seen worse things in his lifetime, and it showed. When we reached the spot, the body was still there, of course. But there was something else now, too. Something I hadn't noticed before. 
tracks leading away from the body deeper into the woods. They were too big to be human, too wide and clawed to belong to any animal I'd ever seen. Paul knelt beside the body, poking at the wounds with the barrel of his shotgun. This wasn't a bear, he muttered. I didn't say anything. It was obvious. What do you reckon? I finally asked. He stood up, his face grim. We're not dealing with something normal here, Boone. The words hung in the air, heavy and unsettling. Then what the hell is it? Paul didn't answer right away. Instead, he studied the tracks leading into the forest, his eyes narrowing like he was calculating something. There's something old in these woods, he said slowly, as if he didn't want to admit it. I've heard stories, hell, even seen things, but this is different. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. What are you talking about? He turned to me, eyes cold and hard. We need to go back, get some supplies. Supplies? What the hell was he planning? Wait, you're not thinking of going after this thing, are you? Got a better idea? He asked, and when I didn't answer, he headed back toward his cabin. I followed him in silence, trying to wrap my head around the situation. The smart thing would have been to call someone, anyone, who dealt with this sort of thing. But out here, the nearest law enforcement was miles away, and even if they showed up, what could they do? When we got back to Paul's, he pulled out an old army rucksack and started loading it with supplies. Extra ammunition, flashlights, a couple of hunting knives. I stood there like an idiot, still trying to process the fact that we were gearing up to hunt whatever killed that guy. You got a gun? Paul asked, not looking up from his task. No. He tossed me one from a shelf near the door. Take this. Don't hesitate to use it. It was an old revolver, heavy and cold in my hands. I wasn't much for guns, but something told me I'd need it. We set off again, this time following the tracks deeper into the woods. The sun was starting to dip, casting long shadows over the ground, and the temperature had dropped noticeably. I felt that eerie silence again, like the forest itself was holding its breath. The tracks led us to a ravine I'd never seen before. It was narrow, steep, and lined with jagged rocks. Paul stopped at the edge and pointed to the bottom. There, he said. I looked down. There was a cave barely visible through the brush. The tracks led right to it. Paul crouched down, inspecting the ground. This thing's big and fast. How can you tell? Tracks are fresh, but they're spaced out. Whatever it is, it's moving with purpose. I swallowed hard, gripping the revolver tighter. So what's the plan? We go in. Of course, that was the plan. I wasn't thrilled about it, but what choice did we have? Whatever killed that man was still out here, and if we didn't find it, it was only a matter of time before it found us. We descended into the ravine, careful not to make too much noise. The air was colder down here, and the smell, God, the smell, was thick and putrid, like death. Paul took the lead, flashlight in one hand, shotgun in the other. I followed close behind, the revolver feeling too small in my grip. The cave was larger than it looked from above, and as we stepped inside, the light from Paul's flashlight danced off the walls, revealing crude symbols carved into the rock. They weren't natural. They weren't made by any animal. What the hell is this? I whispered. Paul didn't answer. He was focused on the tunnel ahead, his shoulders tense. We moved deeper, the sound of our footsteps swallowed by the oppressive darkness. The walls closed in and I felt the weight of the mountain above us. Suddenly, Paul stopped. You hear that? I strained to listen. There was a faint sound like breathing, but not human. It was slow, deliberate, like whatever was making it knew we were coming. My heart pounded in my chest, and every instinct I had was screaming at me to turn around and run. Then, without warning, something moved in the shadows. It was quick, a blur of motion, and before I could react, Paul was knocked to the ground, his flashlight skittering across the floor. I fired blindly into the darkness, the sound of the gunshots deafening in the confined space. Whatever it was, it was massive. Its skin was gray, leathery, and covered in scars, but what caught my eye was its face. It wasn't an animal, not exactly. It had the elongated snout of a wolf, but the body, Christ, the body was all wrong. Muscular hunched and unnaturally fast. It lunged at Paul, knocking him to the ground. He struggled beneath its weight, 
but the thing was too strong. I fired again, and this time the bullet found its mark. The creature howled, not in pain but in rage, and turned its attention to me. I barely had time to raise the gun before it was on me, claws raking across my chest. The pain was blinding, but adrenaline kept me moving. I kicked at it, trying to push it off, but it was relentless. It wasn't just trying to kill me, it was playing with me. Paul, bleeding and half-conscious, somehow managed to grab his shotgun. With a grunt, he pulled the trigger. The blast echoed through the cave and the creature let out a terrible sound before collapsing. I rolled away, gasping for breath. Paul staggered to his feet, his face pale, blood soaking his shirt. We need to go, I managed to choke out. Paul nodded, but we both knew it wasn't over. That thing, it was still breathing. We left the cave in a hurry, not looking back. When we finally made it out, the last sliver of daylight was fading. Neither of us spoke the whole way back, and I didn't care to know if Paul believed what we saw, or if he even cared. All I knew was that whatever was in that cave wasn't natural, and it sure as hell wasn't going to stay dead for long. The smell hit me first, that damp, decaying stench you only get deep in the woods when something's been dead for a while. I've lived out here long enough to know when something's off, and when the air smells like this you're either about to stumble on a carcass, or something worse. But I guess that's what you get when you decide to live off the grid in rural Idaho. It was 1994, and my name's Jethro Wade, been living out here for five years. It's just me, a few chickens, and a cabin I built myself. There's something about the quiet out here that keeps my head clear, you know? I've never been much of a people person. Grew up in a city, always hated it. The noise, the smell of car exhaust, and people crammed in every corner. Out here you've got space to breathe. Sure, there's no cell service, no running water unless you rig something up, but I like it this way. Well, I did, until yesterday. Now, I'll admit I'm not a gun guy. That's usually the first thing people ask when they hear I'm living out in the middle of nowhere. Jethro, why don't you carry a rifle? You'd think it was a requirement, like a badge of honor or something. Truth is, I've never felt the need. I keep to myself, avoid any trouble, and the animals out here don't bother me as long as I stay out of their way. Or so I thought. It all started with that smell. I was out gathering firewood when I caught a whiff of it. At first I figured maybe a deer had wandered too close and gotten itself hurt or sick. That happens out here. But this was thicker, heavier... Something big had died, and not recently. Now, being out here on your own means you don't call animal control when you find something like that. You investigate, deal with it, and move on. But as I got closer to the source, things started feeling... wrong. Not just the smell, either. There was this dead silence that hung in the air, which was strange, considering I'm used to hearing the forest hum with life. Birds, insects even the occasional rustle of squirrels. But today, nothing. I've got this big old oak tree that's fallen down about half a mile from my place. That's where the smell seemed to be coming from. As I stepped around the trunk, I froze. There, in the dirt, was something I couldn't quite wrap my head around. It was a mess of fur and limbs, but not in the way you'd expect from a bear or something. Whatever this was, it had been mauled torn apart like it had been caught in a blender. And here's the thing. I couldn't tell what kind of animal it was. It looked like something between a wolf and a mountain lion, but bigger, and its limbs. There were too many of them. For a minute, I thought maybe some other predator had dragged this thing here from deeper in the woods, but I didn't see any tracks around. Nothing that explained what could have done this. I crouched down, trying to get a better look, when I heard something. Not the usual forest noises but a low, gurgling sound, like something was choking. It was faint, but unmistakable. I stood up, scanning the trees. I couldn't see anything, but that feeling in my gut told me I wasn't alone. My cabin wasn't far, so I decided to head back. If I was being watched, I wasn't about to stick around to find out by what. When I got back to the cabin, I locked the door, something I don't normally do. Living out here, I never really needed to. It's funny, though. After five years of solitude, it's easy to forget how unsettling it can be to feel vulnerable like that. I tried to shake it off, made myself a coffee, 
sat on the porch and told myself it was nothing, just nature being weird. But then, just before dusk, I saw movement in the distance. It was fast, darting between the trees. I squinted, trying to make out what it was, but it kept disappearing, reappearing. Whatever it was, it was moving on all fours. At first I thought it might be a mountain lion, but it was too big, and the way it moved, something about it wasn't right. It didn't have the grace or the rhythm you'd expect from an animal that's used to the wild. It was jerky, almost like it wasn't comfortable in its own skin. Now here's where things get strange. I'm sitting there, watching this thing, when I see something hanging from its mouth, something long and pale, swinging with each awkward step it took. I didn't get a good look, but it was too big to be a rabbit or a squirrel. And the shape, it looked disturbingly human. I'm not ashamed to admit that's when the fear really hit me. I grabbed the hatchet I keep for splitting wood, knowing full well it wasn't going to do much if this thing came for me. But what else was I going to do? Invited in for tea? I didn't sleep that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I thought I heard scratching at the door or footsteps on the porch. But every time I checked, there was nothing. Morning came, and I decided I needed answers. If there was some predator out here that had started hunting people, someone needed to know about it. There's a small ranger station about five miles from my cabin. I figured I could make the walk, tell them what I saw, and maybe they'd have some idea of what was going on. About halfway there, I found something that stopped me dead in my tracks. There, in the middle of the trail, was a boot. Just one. It looked old, scuffed, and covered in dried mud. I picked it up, turning it over, and that's when I saw the blood. It wasn't much, just a small smear on the sole, but it was fresh. I stood there for a minute, just holding that boot, trying to figure out how it got there and what it meant. And then I heard it again, that same gurgling sound from the day before. This time, it was closer, much closer. I dropped the boot and ran. I'm not ashamed to say it. I bolted back to the cabin as fast as I could. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't playing games anymore. I barely made it back before I heard it crashing through the trees behind me. I slammed the door shut, threw the deadbolt, and waited. My breath was coming in shallow, quick bursts, and all I could do was listen as the thing circled the cabin. It wasn't quiet this time. There was a deliberate noise like it wanted me to know it was there. Heavy footfalls almost like it was testing the ground, seeing if it could get through. I could hear it pacing, stopping every now and then like it was considering its options. And then, it stopped. I waited, not daring to move, but the silence dragged on. After what felt like an eternity, I decided to peek out the window. Big mistake. It was standing there just at the edge of the tree line. Not moving, just staring at the cabin. Or at least that's what it looked like. I couldn't make out its face clearly, but I could see the outline of its body. It was hunched, like it was too tall to stand upright, with long, spindly arms that almost dragged on the ground. And then I saw what it had in its hand. A leg. A human leg. That's when I knew this wasn't just some animal. This was something else. Something that shouldn't exist. I stepped away from the window, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst. I couldn't think straight. Couldn't figure out what to do next. And then it hit the door. Full force. The whole cabin shook with the impact, and I stumbled back, dropping the hatchet. It hit again, harder this time, and I knew the door wasn't going to hold. I grabbed the hatchet and braced myself ready for whatever came next. But instead of another hit, I heard a sickening crunch. I rushed to the window again, and that's when I saw the thing dragging something behind it. Something human, something broken. It had found someone else, and it was dragging them into the woods, just like it had done with that boot. I didn't follow. I couldn't. Instead, I sat there in the cabin, trying to convince myself that this wasn't real. But the smell, that smell of decay was still there thick in the air. Eventually, I worked up the nerve to leave the cabin. I wasn't going to stick around for round two. By midday, I'd packed up my essentials and started the long walk back to the ranger station. I didn't stop, didn't look back, and by the time I reached the station, I was practically in a full-blown panic. 
I told them everything, about the smell, the thing in the woods, the leg. They looked at me like I was nuts, of course. But then one of the rangers, an older guy, maybe in his fifties, pulled me aside. He didn't say much, just asked a few questions about where I lived and how far out it was. Then he told me to keep my mouth shut about what I saw. He didn't give me an explanation or offer to help, just a stern warning to let it go and not come back to the station asking about it again. That should have been my first clue that whatever this was, it wasn't something the rangers, or anyone for that matter, wanted to deal with. I wasn't in the mood to argue. I figured I'd be safer anywhere but my cabin, so I decided to head into the nearest town, about twenty miles away. I thought I'd catch my breath, maybe talk to someone who could make sense of it all. By the time I got to town, I was exhausted. I found the only bar in the place, ordered a drink, and started thinking about my next move. That's when I overheard two locals talking at a nearby table. They were discussing the woods, not in a casual way, but in hushed tones like they knew something. I moved closer, pretending to fiddle with my drink. One of them, a guy in his sixties with a weathered face, was talking about how people had gone missing in that area over the past few decades. Not just hikers or campers, locals too. Families that lived off the grid, people who were out of touch with the rest of the world. They just up and vanish, the old man said, lowering his voice. Nobody finds them, and if they do, well, they ain't in one piece. His friend looked around nervously before adding, You think it's animals? Bears, maybe? The old man shook his head. Ain't no bear doing that. Bears kill for food, but whatever's out there, it ain't eating. It's taking parts, leaving the rest. I've seen the remains. Messed up. My stomach dropped. I wanted to ask them more, but I couldn't bring myself to admit that I'd seen something. The last thing I needed was for people to think I was losing my mind, especially after that ranger's warning. So I kept quiet, downed my drink, and headed for the local motel. Sleep didn't come easy that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that thing standing at the tree line, dragging that leg through the dirt. I tried to rationalize it, tell myself it was a bad dream, but the details were too clear, too vivid. I hadn't dreamed that up. The next morning, I made up my mind, and I, I was going to pack up my things and leave the cabin for good. Whatever was out there in those woods wasn't something I wanted to mess with, and I wasn't about to wait around to become its next victim. I got a ride back to my cabin from one of the locals who worked at the bar. He didn't ask why I'd been in town, and I didn't offer any explanations. As we pulled up to the cabin, everything seemed normal. The smell was gone, the forest was quiet, and for a split second I thought maybe I'd imagined it all. But then I saw it. A pile of bones neatly stacked on the porch. Not animal bones. Human ones. I could tell from the size, the shape of the ribs, the fragments of skull. My heart stopped. The guy who'd given me the ride saw it too, his face going pale. He didn't say a word, just put the truck in reverse and sped off, leaving me standing there like a fool. I didn't go inside. I couldn't. I backed away, feeling the bile rise in my throat. My cabin, my sanctuary for the past five years had become something else. A feeding ground, a trophy case. Whatever this thing was, it had left its mark. That was when I heard the noise again. Not the gurgling sound from before, but something worse. A deep, wet, crunching noise coming from behind the cabin, like something was tearing into flesh. I didn't even think. I ran. I ran harder than I've ever run in my life back down the dirt path, away from the cabin, away from that thing. I didn't stop until I reached the highway where I flagged down a passing car. I don't even remember what I said to the driver, something about an emergency, about needing to get the hell out of there. He didn't ask questions, just drove. I ended up in a town about 40 miles away. I stayed in a motel again, trying to figure out what to do. I wasn't going back. I didn't care about the cabin, about my things, about anything. None of it was worth it if I had to face whatever was in those woods again. The next morning I got a call from the local sheriff. Turns out the guy who'd driven me back to my cabin had called them, told them what he saw on the porch. They were investigating. I wanted to tell them everything, but I held back. Something about that ranger's warning kept replaying in my mind. And I wasn't about to poke that bear, metaphorically speaking, of course. Instead, I told the sheriff I'd been out of town and hadn't seen anything. He didn't sound convinced, but he didn't push it. 
A few days later, I got another call. This time, it wasn't the sheriff. It was a man claiming to be from the government. He didn't say which branch, didn't give me his name. All he said was that I needed to stop asking questions, stop talking to people about what I'd seen. He told me they were handling the situation. Handling the situation. What the hell did that mean? I didn't argue. I wasn't going to fight with some faceless government official who seemed to know more about what was going on than I did. But his call left me with more questions than answers. What were they handling? How long had this been going on? And most importantly, what the hell was that thing in the woods? I didn't stick around to find out. I left Idaho the next day, packed up my truck, and drove until I hit the state line. I haven't looked back since. But here's the thing. I know I'm not the only one who's seen it. I know there are others out there who've had similar experiences. People who've lost loved ones, people who've disappeared. And if I'm right, that thing is still out there, somewhere, waiting for the next person dumb enough to wander too far into the woods. You can call me crazy if you want. I wouldn't blame you. Hell, part of me wishes I was. But I know what I saw, and I know that thing wasn't done. Not by a long shot. And the bones? They weren't a warning. They were a gift to someone. I'd never thought the middle of nowhere could feel so crowded. That's what I used to tell people when they asked why I preferred living off the grid. You think Wyoming's sprawling wilderness would offer endless solitude, but sometimes it feels like you're never truly alone out there. I should have left when I had the chance. But of course, hindsight's always 2020. My name's Everett Green, and back in 1995, I'd been living off the grid near Bighorn National Forest for the better part of five years. No power lines, no neighbors, no interruptions. A quiet life, if you ignore the wildlife, but that's half the charm, right? I built my own cabin on a small plot of land surrounded by dense woods, a nearby stream for water, and enough land to grow what I needed. I wasn't trying to hide from the world, I just didn't fit in with it. I'd been a contractor for years, good money but it took a toll. Too many jobs, too many people complaining about insignificant problems like their faucets leaking or a tile being a shade off, so I cut out all the noise and moved where no one could find me unless they really, really tried. Now, living off the grid sounds peaceful until it isn't. And on that particular night I was reminded why people are better off in their homes locked behind doors with street lights shining on their streets. It wasn't just the wild animals that should keep you up at night. I was sitting in my cabin nursing a lukewarm beer and thinking about heading out to check my traps when I heard something, distant at first like a faint rustle in the trees. Now normally that wouldn't bother me. Critters roam around all the time out here, rabbits, deer, the occasional elk. But this was different. The sound grew closer, heavier. Not like the scurry of paws, but the deliberate thud of something large moving through the underbrush. I grabbed my flashlight, more out of curiosity than concern. I wasn't armed at the time, which, looking back, was a stupid choice. But my rifle was in the shed, and I hadn't felt the need to carry it around with me inside my own cabin. Stupid, right? When I stepped outside, the cool night air hit me, and the noise had stopped. There was nothing but the wind and the creaking of the trees around me. I almost wrote it off as just a bear or maybe a moose wandering too close, but then I saw it. At first, it was just a shadow moving between the trees, something big but too quick for me to catch a solid glimpse. All right, Everett, I muttered to myself, half laughing at my nerves. You've been out here too long. I should have gone back inside. Instead, I stepped off the porch, moving toward the tree line where I'd last seen the shadow. There was a sort of thrill in the unknown, maybe something to break the monotony of isolation. But as I got closer, my gut twisted. The smell hit me first, a rancid, sour stench, like rotting meat left out in the sun for days. I covered my nose with my sleeve and continued forward. The flashlight beam cut through the dark, illuminating the gnarled trees and the thick underbrush, but I couldn't see anything. I took a few more steps, and that's when I heard it, a low, throaty snarl. It wasn't a bear. I'd heard bears before, and they're more guttural. No, this was something else, something worse. It sounded like whatever it was, it wasn't too pleased with me standing there. Before I could react, the thing burst from the bushes to my right, 
moving faster than anything that size had any right to. I caught a brief look. Long limbs covered in matted fur, like a wolf or maybe a coyote, but much, much bigger. Its body was twisted, almost malformed, and its mouth opened in a grotesque way, showing teeth too large for its snout. I stumbled back, falling hard on my back, the flashlight flying from my hand. Instinctively, I rolled to the side, scrambling to get my feet under me, and sprinted back toward the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the undergrowth. I barely made it inside before I slammed the door shut, locking it behind me. The cabin walls felt too thin all of a sudden. I backed away, eyes darting to the small window near the door, expecting to see the thing clawing at the wood any second. But there was nothing. Silence. I should have felt relieved, but the stench was still there, lingering in the air, almost suffocating. I grabbed the rifle off the wall, hands trembling as I loaded a few shells into it. If whatever that thing was came through the door, I wasn't going down without a fight. Minutes passed, then what felt like hours. I waited, listening, barely breathing, but the cabin remained eerily quiet. Then a knock. I froze. Another knock, louder this time, followed by a voice. Hello? Anyone in there? The relief was almost palpable. A person, a human voice. I hurried to the door, rifle still in hand, but I hesitated. What the hell was someone doing all the way out here? I hadn't seen another soul for months. Who's there? I called through the door. I'm lost, the voice said, sounding frustrated. I got turned around in the woods. Can you help me? I peeked through the small window next to the door and saw a man standing just beyond the porch, wearing a dirty jacket and jeans. He looked rough, like he'd been out there for a while. His face was gaunt, eyes sunken in, but he didn't seem threatening. Just desperate. Against my better judgment, I unlocked the door and opened it slightly, keeping the chain on. How'd you get all the way out here? I asked, eyeing him suspiciously. I was camping with some buddies, he said. Got separated and lost my gear. I've been walking for hours. Just need to rest for a bit. Maybe get some water. There was something off about him, though. Something I couldn't put my finger on. Maybe it was the way he was standing, too stiff, or the way his eyes flicked from side to side as if he was scanning for something. All right, I said, keeping the door partially closed. I'll get you some water, but you're not coming in. The man's expression changed, just for a second, but it was enough to make my skin crawl. His smile faltered, and his eyes, dark and unreadable, narrowed slightly. Thanks, he said, stepping back. I locked the door again, grabbed a bottle of water from the fridge, and went back to the door, cracking it open just enough to pass the bottle through. As soon as I handed it to him, his hand shot out and grabbed the door, yanking it open with surprising force. I stumbled back, raising the rifle, but he was fast, too fast. He was inside before I could even react, slamming the door behind him. You should have just let me in, he growled. I aimed the rifle at his chest, finger on the trigger. Get out, I said, voice steady, despite the panic rising inside me. He didn't move, just stood there, staring at me. And that's when I noticed something... off. His skin looked wrong, too pale, almost translucent. And his fingers... they were too long the nails black and jagged like claws. "'What the hell are you?' I demanded, taking a step back. He grinned, showing teeth that were far too sharp for any human. "'You wouldn't believe me if I told you,' he said, lunging forward. I pulled the trigger, the blast echoing through the cabin. He staggered back, clutching his chest, but he didn't go down. Blood poured from the wound, but instead of collapsing, he just stood there, laughing. "'You think that's enough to stop me?' he sneered, taking another step forward." I fired again, hitting him square in the stomach, but it was like shooting at a brick wall. The bullets didn't slow him down. He kept coming, faster now, his face contorting into something monstrous. I didn't have time to think, just react. I swung the rifle like a bat, hitting him across the face. He snarled, grabbing the barrel and ripping it from my hands before tossing it across the room like it was nothing. Too bad, he said, voice dripping with malice. You could have made this easy. He lunged at me, but I managed to duck just in time, grabbing a knife off the counter and slashing at his arm. The blade sunk in, but it didn't seem to faze him. He grabbed me by the throat, lifting me off the ground like I weighed nothing. 
This was it. This was how I was going to die, choked out by some inhuman freak in the middle of nowhere. But then there was a sound, a low, rumbling growl from outside. His grip on my throat loosened, and he turned his head toward the window, eyes widening in fear. No, he whispered, dropping me to the floor. Not now. I gasped for air, clutching my throat as I scrambled to my feet. Whatever had scared him was still outside, and it was coming closer. The man, if you could still call him that, looked back at me, his face twisted in terror. You have to help me, he said, voice trembling. Before I could answer, the door exploded inward, and the creature stepped inside. It was huge, standing on two legs like a man but covered in thick, matted fur. Its body was twisted and deformed, with limbs that were too long and joints that bent the wrong way. Its mouth opened wide, revealing rows of jagged teeth, and it let out a sound that made my blood run cold. The man, the thing, screamed and tried to run, but the creature was faster. It lunged forward, grabbing him by the throat and lifting him off the ground like a rag doll. He thrashed and screamed, but it was no use. The creature tore into him, ripping him apart like he was nothing. Blood sprayed across the room, coating the walls and floor in a thick, sticky mess. I watched in horror, too stunned to move, as the creature devoured him. It didn't stop until there was nothing left but a mangled pile of flesh and bone. Then it turned its attention to me. For a moment we just stared at each other, and I thought for sure I was next. But then it did something unexpected. It stepped back, almost as if it was... bowing. Then, without a sound, it turned and walked back out into the night, disappearing into the trees. I don't know why it spared me. Maybe it recognized that I wasn't the real threat. Or maybe it just wasn't hungry anymore. I stayed locked inside that cabin until morning, rifle in hand, waiting for something else to come. But nothing did. By the time I mustered up the courage to go outside, the sun was just starting to rise, casting a faint light over the blood-soaked ground. The body was still there, or what was left of it. I buried it, though I didn't know why. It wasn't like anyone was going to come looking for him. No one came out here. Not unless they were running from something. And me? I'm still here. In 1996, I found myself settling into a patch of rugged forest land in northern Idaho, a place most people wouldn't bother with. But then again, I've never been like most people. My name's Lowell Krell, and I like my space, especially since I'd spent half my life putting up with other people's nonsense. This spot up near the Cabinet Mountains was perfect. No neighbors, no traffic, just me and the thick woods. After bouncing around jobs in small towns, everything from carpentry to construction, I decided to live off the grid. Simpler, I thought. Fewer headaches. I'd been living in that cabin for about five years by the time things got strange. I wasn't armed. Not because I was against it, but more because I'd never felt the need to be. Truth is, when you're out here for long enough, you get used to the quiet. You start to recognize the sounds the woods make, and after a while, anything out of the ordinary just stands out. I'm talking things like how the wind whistles through the pines or the sound of the river rushing down the rocks. That's why when something doesn't belong, you notice it immediately. And that's what happened one evening just after sunset. I was chopping wood out back when I heard a crack in the brush. Not the kind that comes from a squirrel darting through the undergrowth, but something heavy. Big. I looked up, wiped the sweat from my forehead, and listened for a minute. At first I thought it was a deer, maybe an elk. There's plenty of wildlife up here, though nothing really dangerous, unless you're stupid enough to corner a moose. But this, this was different. The silence afterward was thick, unnatural, like the whole forest had stopped breathing. That's when I got the first feeling something wasn't right. Figuring it was nothing, I went inside, made myself some coffee, and sat by the small window that faced the forest. That's when I saw a movement again, something fast, darting between the trees. It was too quick to make out clearly, but big enough that it caught my attention. I cracked a joke to myself, something about maybe needing glasses, but it didn't quite land. There was no laughter in the air, just that heavy quiet. An hour later, the noises started again, 
only now it was closer. Something heavy was moving just outside my cabin, but every time I got to the window, it stopped. I kept telling myself it was just some curious animal, maybe a bear, but there was a part of me that knew better. When the noise started up a third time, I grabbed the flashlight, stepped outside, and scanned the tree line. For a second, everything was still. Then, from the corner of my eye, I saw it. A shape, low to the ground, like it was crouching, but large enough that it shouldn't have been able to move that fast. I yelled something. Probably not the smartest move, but whatever it was stopped dead in its tracks. There was a low rustling sound, like leaves being dragged across the ground, and then silence again. I was frozen in place, flashlight beam dancing along the edge of the forest, waiting for something to happen. But nothing did. Not yet, anyway. The next day I found tracks. They were deep, spaced far apart, almost like whatever it was had a long stride. But what really got me was that they weren't shaped like any animal I knew. They were sort of round at the front but tapered off toward the back, with odd claw marks digging into the dirt. My first thought was maybe a mountain lion, but I've seen those tracks before. This wasn't even close. Now, I'm not the kind of guy who spooks easy. I've been around nature long enough to know what's what, but these tracks, they weren't anything I recognized and that didn't sit right with me. Still, I tried to shake it off, kept myself busy with work around the cabin, and chalked the whole thing up to a trick of the light. I mean, what else could it be? But that night, everything went to hell. It was just after midnight when I woke up to the sound of something scraping against the cabin. Not gentle, like a branch brushing the wood. This was deliberate, like claws dragging along the side of the house. I sat up, heart pounding, and reached for the flashlight. The scraping stopped, but before I could even get out of bed, something slammed against the wall. Hard. The whole cabin shook, and I swear I could feel the floorboards vibrate beneath me. I grabbed my boots and pulled them on, fumbling to get the flashlight in my hand. Another thud, this one stronger, rattled the window above my head. I flicked on the light and headed for the door, thinking maybe I'd scare whatever it was away. But when I stepped outside, I was met with a sight that I still can't quite shake from my mind. There it was, hunched over in the clearing about thirty feet from the cabin, its back to me. It was huge, bigger than any bear I'd ever seen, but not shaped like one. Its body was long, lean, covered in some kind of coarse, matted hair. The legs were bent like it was crouching, and I could see muscles rippling under the skin as it moved, slow and deliberate. But it was the arms, if you could call them that, that made my stomach drop. They were long, too long, like those of a primate. But the way they ended in twisted, sharp-looking claws? That's when I realized I wasn't looking at any animal I'd ever seen before. I was rooted to the spot, not knowing whether to run or to stay and hope it didn't see me. My brain was doing that thing where it just refuses to process what's right in front of you because it doesn't make sense. And then, as if it sensed me, the thing turned. It's hard to explain what I saw in that moment. It was like a cross between a large, feral dog and something else entirely, something wrong. Its face was elongated, almost canine, but distorted, twisted, with patches of fur missing. The mouth? full of jagged teeth that didn't fit right, as though they'd grown in all at once, crowding out its jaw. I stood there, flashlight beam shaking as I tried to make sense of it. I heard a loud snap, and that's when it lunged, straight at me, faster than anything that size had a right to move. I bolted back into the cabin, slamming the door behind me, but the thing hit the wall hard enough to knock the lamp off the table. I grabbed the closest thing I had, an axe, and stood there, back against the door, waiting for it to bust through. But it didn't. Instead, I heard it circling the cabin, scraping its claws along the walls, the windows, like it was testing the place, looking for a weak spot. For the next hour, it kept at it, circling, pacing, but never quite coming back to the door. I stood there, waiting for it to break in, my knuckles white around the axe handle. Then, just as quickly as it started, it stopped. The silence that followed was worse than the noise. It was like the whole forest had gone back to sleep, and I was left standing there, alone, in the dark. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I spent the next few hours sitting by the window, watching, 
waiting for it to come back. But it didn't. Not then, anyway. The next morning I found fresh tracks, deeper this time, leading away from the cabin and into the woods. They didn't look like anything I'd ever seen. I took a picture, thinking maybe I'd show it to someone, anyone, who could tell me what I was dealing with. But part of me knew that even with proof, no one would believe me. That evening, I packed up whatever I could carry and started the long hike down to the nearest town. I didn't look back. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't something I wanted to face again, not alone. A few days later, I got word that a hunter had gone missing in those same woods, not far from where my cabin stood. They found his remains scattered across a small clearing, and from what I heard, the authorities couldn't explain what had killed him. They didn't even try. And that's where I left it. I haven't been back to that cabin since. If you ask me, there's a reason those woods are as empty as they are. There's something out there. Something that doesn't belong. I had never liked people all that much, which is probably why I decided to live off the grid in the first place. My name's Ethan Nix, and in 1996, I packed everything I owned into an old pickup and drove north to the woods of Maine. No cell service, no neighbors, just me and the trees. It sounds cliche, but when you spend 12 years working as an EMT in a big city, you start to crave a little quiet. Quiet's not all it's cracked up to be, though. I picked out a spot about 10 miles west of Eagle Lake, just before the snow started coming down in heavy sheets that fall. A guy I met in town, Will Larson, sold me a cabin on the cheap, one of those as-is deals where the roof's a little busted and the floorboards creak no matter how much weight you put on them. But I didn't mind. I had my tools, plenty of firewood, and enough canned goods to last me through winter. What I didn't know at the time was that I'd be out of here before the spring thaw. Now, before you think this is one of those backwoods lunatic stories, let me clarify. I'm a rational man, Maybe I didn't exactly fit in with the city folks, but I sure as hell wasn't the kind of guy who believed in anything weird. No ghosts, no Bigfoot, none of that nonsense. So when strange things started happening around the cabin, I did what any sensible man would do. I ignored it. At first, it was small stuff. A few raccoons getting into my shed. Once or twice I thought I heard footsteps out in the woods at night, but you'd be surprised how much the wind can trick your ears when there's no background noise. Still, it put me on edge. I've always been a light sleeper, and every time I woke up in the middle of the night, I'd grab my flashlight and rifle, check outside, and find nothing. I joked with Will that maybe I was going a little nuts out there, but he just laughed it off and said, Eagle Lake's got plenty of critters, but nothing that'll mess with you if you mind your own business. That changed two months later. It was early February, cold enough to freeze the snot inside your nose the moment you stepped outside. I'd been chopping wood most of the afternoon and was finishing up when I noticed something odd near the tree line. At first glance, it looked like a pile of branches, maybe from a moose or something pushing through the trees, but when I got closer, I saw it wasn't branches. It was bones. Deer bones, stripped clean, scattered in a way that didn't sit right. There was no blood, no tracks, just bones, all cracked open like something had been after the marrow. I'd seen my share of dead animals, both from natural causes and the not-so-natural ones, but this wasn't normal. The weirdest part, there was no smell. Usually, a kill site reeks, especially when the temperature warms up a bit, but these bones seemed almost clean. I wasn't sure what to make of it, so I did what any logical man would do. I left it alone. Maybe a wolf or something had gotten to it, but it stayed in my head for days. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, even when I was alone in the cabin. You know how sometimes you just know someone's behind you, but when you turn around, there's no one there? That's what it was like every night, no matter how hard I tried to ignore it. It was about a week later when things got worse. I was sitting inside, stoking the fire, when I heard a crash from outside. My first thought was the shed. Maybe the wind knocked something over. But when I went out, the shed door was wide open and my tools were scattered everywhere. Now, I'm not a neat freak, but I keep my tools organized. Wrenches, hammers, everything in its place. But now they were strewn across the snow like some kid had a tantrum. That wasn't even the worst part. 
the deer bones I had seen before? More of them now, scattered outside the shed almost like they'd been placed there deliberately. I couldn't explain it. There weren't any tracks around, no sign of an animal, no nothing. I'll admit I started to get a little freaked out. I locked up the shed, brought my rifle inside, and double-checked all the doors and windows. That night I slept with the rifle loaded next to my bed just in case. The next few days were quiet, almost too quiet. I kept telling myself it was just my imagination, that maybe I'd worked myself up over nothing. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. I stopped going outside after dark, even for firewood. I didn't even let the radio static bother me anymore, I just kept it off entirely. Then came the night I'll never forget. I had just finished dinner, a can of beans and some jerky, when I heard a noise. This deep, rumbling noise, like something heavy moving just outside the cabin. It wasn't the wind this time. I grabbed my rifle, turned off the lantern, and pressed my ear against the door. The noise was closer now, like something was scraping against the side of the cabin. For a moment, I considered shouting, maybe firing a warning shot, but I didn't. Something told me that was a bad idea. Instead, I crouched by the window, peeking out through a crack in the shutters, and that's when I saw it. Now, I've seen bears, moose, wolves, you name it, but this thing... This wasn't any animal I'd ever seen. It was big, at least seven feet tall if it was standing on two legs, but it wasn't. It moved low to the ground, crawling like it was sniffing around for something. Its body was thin, too thin for something that big. Its limbs were long, almost too long, like they were stretched out of proportion. And the way it moved, it was like it wasn't used to being on all fours, like it was uncomfortable in its own skin. It had fur, patchy in some places, like an animal with mange, but there was something else, something underneath. I could see the muscles twitching beneath its skin, and its mouth. God, its mouth was full of sharp, jagged teeth. No lips to hide them, just teeth always exposed. I stayed frozen by the window, praying it didn't see me. It circled the cabin a few times, scraping its claws, yes, claws against the wood, sniffing at the air. It was like it knew I was inside, but couldn't find a way to get in. At least not yet. After what felt like an eternity, it finally left, disappearing into the woods as quietly as it had come. I didn't move for at least an hour after that. When I finally got the courage to stand, my legs were shaking so bad I nearly collapsed. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. Every sound, every creak of the wood made me jump. I thought about running, grabbing my truck and driving until I hit a town. But that thing was still out there, and I had no idea if it could run faster than me. The next morning I checked around the cabin, and sure enough, the tracks were there, deep, clawed imprints in the snow leading from the woods and back again. But what really got me was the shed. The door was torn clean off its hinges, and inside my tools were scattered everywhere again. This time, though, there was more. In the corner near the back of the shed were bones. Not deer this time. Human bones. I recognized the tattered remnants of a jacket, the same kind of jacket Will Larson always wore. I froze when I saw the jacket. It was unmistakable, one of those thick, flannel-lined coats that only someone like Will would wear. My stomach tightened as I walked over and crouched down by the bones, careful not to touch anything. The skull was cracked, half of it missing, but I could still make out enough of the facial structure to know that whoever this was, they hadn't just wandered out here and died of exposure. Will had been missing for weeks. People in town assumed he'd gone on one of his fishing trips up north and hadn't bothered to check in. No one worried too much about him, but now, looking at what was left of him, I knew something had brought him here. Something had torn him apart and left him scattered in my shed like some kind of sick joke. I backed out of the shed, my heart racing, my mind a blur of fear and anger. I'd known Will for months. He was one of the few people I could stand talking to, the only guy in town who didn't treat me like a complete outsider. And now he was nothing but bones. And whatever did this was still out there. I couldn't stay here anymore. I had to leave, but I had to do it smart. Running blindly into the woods was a death sentence. Whatever that thing was, it had been watching me, circling my cabin, waiting for its chance. I had to be faster, 
Smarter. I went back inside, packed my rifle, a flashlight, and as much food and water as I could fit into a backpack. Then I grabbed my truck keys. The plan was simple. Make it to the truck, drive out of here as fast as I could, and never look back. The truck was parked a couple of hundred yards away, near the tree line. I'd made the mistake of parking it far from the cabin when I first got here, thinking it would keep the snow from piling up too high around it. Now it felt like the stupidest decision I'd ever made. I opened the cabin door slowly, scanning the trees for any movement. Nothing. Just the sound of the wind howling through the pines. I stepped outside, rifle in hand, and started making my way to the truck. Each step felt like it took an hour, my boots crunching in the snow, the only sound for miles. I was about halfway there when I heard it again, that same low rumbling noise I'd heard the night before. I whipped around, rifle ready, but I couldn't see anything. No movement, no tracks. Just the trees, silent and still. I swallowed hard and kept moving, faster this time, trying not to think about what might be watching me from the shadows. Then I heard a crack, a sharp snap of a branch breaking behind me. I turned and saw it, the thing. It was standing on two legs now, taller than I remembered, towering over the snow like some twisted version of a human. Its mouth was open wide, those sharp teeth exposed again, dripping with something dark. It took a step toward me, its limbs moving unnaturally, as if it was learning how to walk. I didn't think. I raised the rifle and fired. The shot echoed through the trees, and the thing recoiled, stumbling back. I wasn't sure if I'd hit it, but it didn't stop. It just growled and charged at me, moving faster than anything that big should be able to move. I ran. I sprinted toward the truck, my legs burning, heart pounding in my chest. I could hear it behind me, its footsteps thudding in the snow, getting closer with every second. I didn't dare look back. I just ran, focusing on the truck, on the one thing that could get me out of here alive. I reached the truck, fumbling with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I almost dropped them. I could hear the thing behind me, feel its presence closing in. I slammed the key into the ignition, threw the truck into gear and floored it. The tires spun in the snow for a second, but then I lurched forward, the engine roaring as I tore down the narrow path, trees whipping by on either side. In the rearview mirror I could see it, running after me, keeping pace with the truck, its body twisting and contorting with every step. It let out a shriek, not an animal sound, but something else, something worse. But then, as quickly as it started, it stopped. The thing disappeared into the tree line, vanishing into the dark. I didn't stop driving. I kept going. Didn't let off the gas until I hit the main road, miles away from that cabin. My hands were shaking, my mind racing, trying to process what I had just seen. What had happened to Will? But there was no time to think about that. I just needed to get the hell out of there. When I finally pulled into town, I went straight to the sheriff's office. I didn't bother with any explanations, just told them about Will, the bones, everything. They thought I'd lost it, of course. A man living alone in the woods for months, coming into town talking about monsters. Yeah, I didn't exactly make a convincing case, but they couldn't ignore the bones. When they went up there to check, they found Will's remains. Just like I said, they chalked it up to a wolf attack said he must have been out hunting and didn't make it back. But I know better. I know what I saw, and I know it's still out there. I left Maine the next day, didn't even go back to the cabin to grab the rest of my things. I couldn't. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't going to stop. It had already taken Will, and I wasn't about to stick around to find out what else it wanted. Last I heard, they still haven't found anyone to buy the cabin. No surprise there. But here's the thing. Sometimes late at night, when the wind's howling just right. I swear I can hear that same low rumbling sound in the back of my mind, like it's waiting, like it remembers. And I'm not going back to find out. It was 1991, and I was living in a cabin that most people wouldn't call home. Nestled deep in the mountains of West Virginia, it was off the grid in every sense of the word. No electricity, no running water, just a wood stove and a roof that barely kept the rain out. I'd chosen the isolation because, frankly, people exhaust me. I'm not antisocial, 
I just don't like the endless noise of other humans. My name's Cliff Hendricks, and after a decade of bouncing around odd jobs, from being a mechanic to bartending, I finally saved enough to buy this place outright. I figured it'd be the perfect retreat from everything. It wasn't. Not in the way I'd hoped. I kept to myself most days, chopping wood, hunting small game, and occasionally driving the old truck into town for supplies. It was a good life, or so I told myself. There was a kind of peace that came with the isolation, but it also left a lot of time to think. Too much time, really. There was a knock on my door one evening. That was rare. Most folks who knew me knew better than to come out this far unless they had a reason. I opened the door to find two men standing there, ruffled, dirty, and a little out of place. They weren't from the town. The bigger one, six foot something with arms that looked like they could rip trees out of the ground, spoke first. Truck broke down a couple miles back. Mind if we borrow your phone? I didn't have a phone, not even a landline. I hadn't planned on getting visitors, let alone offering help. Still, I wasn't heartless. I don't have a phone. Closest one's in town, but I can give you a ride. My voice felt like gravel coming out, unused to much conversation these days. The smaller guy, who hadn't said a word, just smiled. A smile that didn't sit right. He looked more like someone pretending to be friendly than actually meaning it. Still, I motioned for them to follow me out to the truck. I kept a shotgun in the back. Always had. You never know when you'll run into something you weren't expecting. Whether that's a bear, a bobcat, or a couple of strangers who don't belong. I opened the truck door and something in the air shifted. I caught the look in the big guy's eyes, and just for a second, it was like he'd dropped the act. The smaller one spoke finally, his voice low. We're not going to town. I froze. A lot goes through your head in moments like that. Everything slows down, and you start calculating. These two, they weren't lost. They weren't looking for help. They were looking for something else. I gripped the door handle tighter, trying not to give away that I knew. What do you mean you're not going to town? The big one chuckled. Ain't gonna be no town after this. You should have stayed inside, old man. Old man. That ticked me off. I was barely 40. But then things went from tense to violent faster than I could react. The smaller guy lunged at me, a knife flashing from nowhere. I dodged, narrowly missing the blade, and slammed the truck door into him. Hard. The big guy was already coming around the side, his fists ready. I wasn't much of a fighter, but survival makes you do things you didn't think you could. I swung the door open again, catching him in the ribs before grabbing the shotgun from the back. I didn't want to kill anyone, but they'd left me no choice. The first shot echoed through the trees, sending birds scattering into the evening sky. The smaller guy dropped, his body folding in on itself like a rag doll. The big one kept coming, though, as if the sound of gunfire didn't even register. He roared, some guttural sound like a wounded animal, and lunged at me. I barely had time to reload. The shotgun's second blast hit him square in the chest, but instead of falling, he staggered like he'd just been punched. His body convulsed and I swear to God, I saw something shift under his skin, like the muscles weren't where they were supposed to be. For a second, I wondered if the damn gun was even working. He stumbled back, but didn't go down, his breathing ragged. I could see his eyes now, wild, furious, and animalistic in a way no human should ever look. He grinned through the blood leaking from his mouth. That all you got? I grabbed an axe from the bed of the truck and we went at it. My hands were shaking, my heart pounding so loud I could barely hear anything else, but I swung, catching him in the leg. He howled in pain this time, dropping to one knee, but then he reached out and grabbed me by the throat. His grip was iron. You're dead, he whispered, his breath hot and foul. I don't know how, but I managed to smash the butt of the axe into his face. His grip loosened and I stumbled back, gasping for air. The guy finally collapsed, twitching on the ground. Blood pooled around him, and for a minute I thought I was safe. That it was over. It wasn't. There was movement in the woods. Figures. More of them. Slowly stepping out from the trees. A woman, her face twisted and scarred beyond recognition. And two more men. Each with the same wild look as the first two. 
They weren't here by accident. They had been hunting me. I backed up toward the cabin, realizing too late that I didn't have enough shells for all of them. I tried not to panic, but it was hard when you've got a bunch of people coming at you like that. Eyes locked on you like you're the next meal. The woman, she was the worst. She moved slower, more deliberate, like she knew I was out of options. And as she came closer, I could see something hanging from her neck. A necklace made of bones. Human bones. I didn't wait for them to get closer. I rushed back into the cabin and barred the door, but I knew it wouldn't hold for long. They were strong, stronger than anyone I'd ever seen. The big guy had shrugged off shotgun blasts like they were nothing. From inside, I heard them talking in low voices, guttural murmurs. They were planning something. My mind raced. Maybe there was a way out. Maybe if I could. The door shattered and they were inside. I fired off the last shell, taking one of them down, but the rest swarmed me. They didn't kill me right away. The woman got close, her breath on my face, and whispered something I'll never forget. We've been here longer than you can imagine. You think you own this land? I didn't have time to process it before she grabbed my arm and snapped it like a twig. The pain was blinding. I screamed, more out of shock than anything else. They dragged me out into the woods. I didn't know how far we went, but eventually we reached a clearing. There were others, more of them, a whole group, some old, some young, all of them looking like they belonged to some twisted, forgotten past. They circled around me, and then I saw it, the thing they worshipped. It wasn't human. It wasn't even close. The creature towered over them, covered in fur, its body massive like some prehistoric beast. Its face, I don't know how to describe it. It was like nothing I'd ever seen, like something that shouldn't exist. I could see the intelligence behind its gaze as it stared at me. One of the men whispered to the creature, and then, without warning, it lunged at one of its own, ripping the man apart as if he was nothing more than a meal. Blood sprayed across the dirt. The others watched, unfazed. I was next. The creature turned its attention to me, and I braced for the end. But instead it stopped, inches from my face. It sniffed the air, then looked at the woman. Not yet, she said, smiling. We'll save you for later. They tied me up and left me there. For how long, I don't know. Hours, maybe days. I thought about escape, but I was too weak, too injured. All I could do was wait and hope for a miracle that never came. Eventually I blacked out. When I woke up, I was alone. The clearing was empty. The creature, the people, they were gone. But the remains of the man they killed? That was still there. Torn apart, pieces of him scattered everywhere. I staggered back to the cabin, barely able to stand. My arm hung useless at my side my body covered in bruises and cuts. I wasn't sure if I'd ever make it out of those woods alive, but I did. I don't know what they were, those people, that thing. Maybe some kind of ancient tribe, maybe something worse. But they're still out there waiting. Not that it matters anymore. They won't be waiting long. It wasn't like I'd planned to get caught up in something so wild. But then again, most people don't, right? I guess I should start by saying I've always preferred being off the grid. The year was 1999, and by that point I'd been living in this cabin in the Ouachita National Forest, Arkansas for five years. It's not much, but it's quiet, and I'd rather deal with my chickens than the traffic or neighbors who never mind their own business. My name's Emmett Reed, by the way, not that it matters much now. People say you run off to the woods when you've got nothing left in life, but that wasn't it for me. I had a good life in Kansas City, worked as a carpenter, even had my own little business, but something always felt off. You ever get that feeling, like you're just grinding away for no good reason? Anyway, I left it all behind, packed up, and settled out here. I hunt my food, grow some vegetables, and it's peaceful. Well, it was. I didn't keep a gun on me, not like most folks out here. It wasn't some moral thing, I'm not one of those types, but it's more about not needing one. You'd be surprised what a good axe can do if it comes down to it. I had a couple of traps set up around my land for small game, and usually I'd check them every morning. So when I didn't catch anything for three days straight, I figured maybe some larger predator was roaming the area. 
That's not unusual. Coyotes, maybe a cougar or something. Then there were the noises, weird ones. At first I thought it was the wind whistling through the trees, but after the second night I knew better. It was this guttural rumble, and I've heard all kinds of animals out here, but this one was... wrong. There's no other way to put it. It all came to a head that Thursday. I'd gone down by the creek to set up a new trap when I noticed something odd. The forest had gone silent. That never happens. Not here. Normally you've got birds chirping, squirrels chattering, the whole deal. But that morning, nothing. And the air felt heavy, like before a thunderstorm, but the sky was clear. As I got closer to the creek, I saw it. The first sign something wasn't right. There was a deer, half submerged in the water. Its body was torn open, its ribcage crushed like it had been stepped on. I've seen what a mountain lion can do to a deer, and this wasn't that. It looked more like someone had dropped a boulder on it from a hundred feet up. I knelt by the carcass, staring at the massive indentations in the ground, like hoof prints, but bigger, almost like the size of a human foot. Except it wasn't a foot, no toes, no heel, just a rounded, solid shape, like it had been pressed into the earth by something impossibly heavy. Now a smart man would have turned back right then, right? Packed up and maybe headed back to civilization for a while? But I'm not a smart man. I figured I'd follow the trail. The tracks led up into the hills, through the densest part of the forest, where even the animals usually don't go. I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe it was curiosity, maybe it was stupidity. I don't have kids or a wife, never did. So it's not like there was anyone waiting for me. I guess in some sick way, I wanted to see what had made those tracks, to prove that whatever it was, I wasn't imagining it. About an hour in, I found the second body. This one was worse. It was a man, or what was left of one. He'd been torn apart, his limbs scattered around like someone had tried to pull him in four different directions. His torso was... gone just a bloody heap where his chest should have been. His head was untouched, though, still sitting there, eyes wide open, staring up at the sky like he hadn't seen it coming. I checked his pockets. He had a wallet, a guy named Daryl Cantrell from Little Rock, based on his ID. The wallet was clean, too clean, considering the state of his body. No blood on it. That didn't make any sense. I stood there for a good five minutes trying to wrap my head around it, that's when I heard it again. The noise, that rumble, deeper than any animal I've ever heard. It came from the direction of the hilltop. Now, I've never been one to scare easily, but there's something primal in a sound like that. It hits you somewhere deep inside, like it's tapping into instincts you forgot you had. I started walking faster, the way I came, back down the hill. It wasn't running, I don't run, but I wasn't sticking around either. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. Not in front of me, but behind. Something big, something dark, moving fast through the trees. I've seen a bear once out here, and this wasn't that. Bears don't move like that. Too graceful. Too fast. And they sure as hell don't have a head that almost looked human. I didn't look back again. I don't know what it was, and I wasn't about to wait around to find out. My legs carried me faster than I thought they could... And soon enough, I was back at the cabin out of breath, clutching my knees like some out-of-shape city slicker. That was the last time I went out to the creek. Two days passed without incident. I didn't hear the rumble again, didn't see the thing stalking the trees. For a second, I thought maybe I'd imagined it, or maybe it had moved on. Wishful thinking, right? That Sunday, just after dawn, I heard the trap outside snap. I remember feeling relieved. Maybe I'd caught a rabbit or something, something normal. But when I opened the door, I stopped cold. The trap had been triggered, sure, but what was in it wasn't normal. It was the head of a rabbit, just the head, placed neatly in the trap. The body was nowhere to be found. No blood, either. Just the head, sitting there like some kind of offering. And standing a few yards away in the woods, I saw it. Clear as day. It wasn't human, but it wasn't entirely animal, either. It stood upright, maybe seven or eight feet tall, with long, sinewy limbs covered in dark fur that looked almost matted, like it had been in a swamp. Its body was hunched, like it didn't fit right in its own skin. And its face... 
God, that face. It had a mouth, wide and thin, like someone had carved a slit into its skull. The mouth stretched all the way across, and it opened in a way that made no sense, like a snake dislocating its jaw. I can't describe it any better than that. And it was staring at me. I didn't think, I just moved, grabbed my axe from the door and ran at it. Now I know what you're thinking. Emmett, that's about the dumbest thing you could have done. You're probably right. But there's something that happens when you're faced with something that shouldn't exist. You either freeze or you fight, and I'm not one to freeze. I swung at it, but the thing moved faster than anything I'd ever seen. It dodged like it knew what I was going to do before I did it. I hit nothing but air, and before I could react, it was on me. Its claws, or whatever you want to call them, ripped through my shirt and into my chest. I felt the warmth of my own blood before I felt the pain. But it didn't go for the kill. Not right away. It was playing with me, like a cat with a mouse. I dropped the axe and scrambled backward, desperate. My back hit the side of the cabin, and for a moment I thought it was over. Then, by some miracle, I remembered the flare gun I kept in the kitchen. I bolted inside, slammed the door, and grabbed it off the shelf. I didn't even aim, just fired through the window. The flare hit the creature in the chest, and for the first time, I heard it scream. It wasn't a roar. It was more like a distorted human scream, like someone trying to imitate a sound they didn't quite understand. It stumbled back, the fur on its chest smoldering from the flare. I didn't stick around to see if it recovered. I grabbed a bag, threw in whatever I could, and got the hell out of there. I didn't stop until I reached the nearest town. I checked into a motel, told the guy at the desk I'd been in an accident. He didn't ask questions, which suited me just fine. A few days later, I went back with a couple of the local guys. We found the cabin ransacked, the windows shattered, and that flare gun lying outside burnt out. The thing didn't vanish. It left marks, broken trees, and bloodstains. But we didn't see it again. At least, I haven't, so yeah. That's why I don't live in the woods anymore. I... The air was sticky that day, the kind that makes you regret stepping outside in the first place. My name's Nathan Malloy. I'd been living off the grid in Montana since 2011, away from everything, away from the job I hated and the people who thought I needed to be social. Not for me. I preferred the quiet. The isolation helped me think, and besides, I didn't need much more than my dog, bear, and a wood stove. Funny, though. Despite being off the map, trouble has a way of finding you, no matter where you are. This all happened in 2017, down by the northern edge of the Flathead National Forest. I'd been running traps near the river, nothing too fancy, just trying to make some cash off beaver pelts. It wasn't anything glamorous, but it put food on the table. That morning, I was about two miles out from my cabin, bear pacing around my feet like he usually did. He was a good dog, better than most people, honestly. But that day, he was acting strange. He kept sniffing the air, whining under his breath. I'm not superstitious, but when a dog like Bear starts acting up, you pay attention. It wasn't long after that when I first smelled it. Now, if you've ever gutted a deer, you know the kind of smell I'm talking about. Rot. Decay. The kind of thing that makes your stomach churn. But this was worse. It was like the air was soaked in death. I figured a bear had gotten to one of my traps and left something to rot. I never imagined what I'd actually find. I pressed forward, pushing through the underbrush until I saw it, a body, or what was left of one. My first thought was a bear had mauled a hunter, but the more I looked, the less sense that made. A bear wouldn't have torn someone up like this, at least not in such a deliberate way. This was... something else. The remains were scattered in a circle, like pieces of a broken puzzle. I'm no forensic expert but the cuts looked clean. Too clean for a bear or wolf. There wasn't much left that was identifiable, but the way the body was laid out felt deliberate, like it had been arranged. The thought that this could be a person's doing crossed my mind, but who the hell would do something like that? And out here, no less? I looked around, trying to find anything, anything at all, that could explain it. That's when I saw the tracks. They weren't bear tracks, not even close, they looked more like a dog's, but bigger. Much bigger. 
and there were more than one set, crisscrossing through the brush like whatever made them had been pacing around the body. Bear started barking wildly, his hackles raised. He darted back and forth in front of me, growling. Not his usual bark, but something deeper, more primal. I crouched down and put a hand on his neck to calm him, but it didn't do much. His muscles were stiff, like he was ready to bolt at any second. I stood up, took one last look at the mess, and decided to get the hell out of there. I wasn't armed, stupid, I know, but I hadn't planned on anything more dangerous than trapping that morning. My cabin wasn't far, and I figured I could at least grab my rifle before I went to report this to the sheriff's office. But something about the tracks stuck with me. They were too fresh, like whatever made them hadn't gone far. I kept glancing over my shoulder, feeling the weight of something watching me. Every snap of a branch, every shift of the trees, it made my skin crawl. I knew I wasn't alone, but I didn't see anything. Yet. The smell, though, it lingered. Like whatever had done this was still out there, somewhere close. When I reached the cabin, I slammed the door behind me and grabbed my rifle from the wall. I wasn't about to go back out there alone, not with whatever that was lurking around. I debated for a moment whether to call the sheriff now or after I checked things out myself. It wasn't like I had a phone that worked out there anyway. The closest signal was a two-hour drive. That's when I heard it, not far off, a low scraping sound like something big dragging itself through the brush. Bear heard it too, his ears pricked, but he didn't bark this time. He just stared at the door, tail between his legs. I held the rifle tight, creeping toward the window to get a look. What I saw didn't make sense at first. It was huge, whatever it was, but hunched over like it was walking on all fours. It wasn't a bear, though. Its body was wrong, more like a cat in the way it moved, fluid and deliberate. But its head... Its head was twisted with teeth like jagged shards of glass. It looked wrong, like nature had put it together in a hurry and got bored halfway through. I should have shot it right then and there, but I froze. I've hunted plenty of big game, but nothing like this. And then it saw me. Before I could even think, the thing barreled toward the cabin. I barely had time to slam the door shut before it hit, hard enough to rattle the windows. Bear was growling now, teeth bared, but even he was smart enough to back off. The thing slammed into the cabin again, making the whole place shake. I backed up, rifle raised, my heart pounding so hard I thought it had burst out of my chest. The door wasn't going to hold, and I knew it. I was trapped. And whatever this thing was, it wasn't going to stop until it got inside. I aimed the rifle at the door, ready to fire the second it broke through. My hands were shaking, but I forced myself to focus. Just as it hit the door a third time, I pulled the trigger. The sound was deafening, the recoil slamming into my shoulder. The thing let out this ungodly sound, like nothing I'd ever heard before. I fired again, then again, until the magazine was empty. Silence. For a moment I thought maybe I'd killed it. But then the door creaked open, hanging off its hinges. I stared at the mess, expecting to see the thing lying there, but all I saw was blood. Thick, dark blood pooling in the dirt outside. But the thing... It was gone. I ran to the door, rifle in hand, scanning the tree line for any sign of movement. There was nothing just the blood trail leading into the woods. I had two choices. I could follow it, or I could leave and never look back. I didn't know if it was smart or just plain stupid, but I grabbed my extra ammo, reloaded, and followed the trail. Bear stayed close to my side, growling softly, his eyes darting around like he expected the thing to jump out at any second. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that whatever it was, it knew I was coming. The blood trail led deeper into the forest, down into a ravine I'd never bothered to explore before. It was darker here, the trees growing thicker, their branches twisting together like skeletal fingers. I could barely see ten feet in front of me, but the smell, the same rotten stench from earlier, it was getting stronger. I heard something behind me, a snap, like a twig breaking underfoot. I whipped around, rifle raised, but saw nothing. Bear was growling again, low and steady, his fur standing on end. Then I saw it. It moved between the trees, barely visible, but its shape. I knew it was the same thing from before, and it wasn't alone. There were three of them now, circling us. I raised the rifle and fired, but they were too fast. One of them lunged at me, its claws tearing through my shirt, 
but I managed to shove it back, firing again. The bullet hit, but it didn't slow the thing down. Another one came at me from the side and Bear jumped at it, biting and snarling. But they were too strong too fast. I ran. I didn't have a choice. I ran deeper into the ravine, the sounds of them chasing me echoing through the trees. Bear was behind me, still fighting, but I couldn't turn back. I didn't know where I was going, just away from them. Suddenly the ground beneath me gave way, and I fell. When I came to, everything was quiet. Too quiet. My leg throbbed, and when I looked down, I saw the blood. But it wasn't mine. It was Bear's. I staggered to my feet, the pain in my leg nearly blinding me. I looked around, but there was no sign of the creatures. Just Bear's body lying in the dirt. He'd saved me, but it had cost him everything. I stood there, rifle in hand, not knowing what to do next. That's when I saw it, standing at the edge of the ravine, watching me. But this time, it didn't charge. It stood there, almost as if it was thinking. I gripped the rifle tighter, my hands slick with sweat and blood, but I didn't fire. We stared at each other for what felt like minutes, though it was probably just seconds. The thing's chest heaved with labored breaths dark blood trickling from a wound in its side where I must have hit it earlier. And then I noticed something that made my stomach churn. There were human bones scattered around the ravine, some old, some recent. This wasn't just some random hunting ground. This was a den. I glanced back at the creature. It wasn't just mindlessly attacking. It had been defending something, maybe others like it, or perhaps something even more disturbing. The realization hit me. I had stumbled into its home. A dark, guttural rumble echoed from the trees behind it, and two more shapes emerged, larger, bulkier than the one in front of me. It wasn't alone. They had followed me here, closing in silently, like a pack of wolves. My mind raced. If I stayed, I'd be dead in minutes. But if I ran, there was nowhere to go. The ravine walls were too steep and my leg was bleeding badly. I couldn't outrun them even if I tried. The largest one stepped forward, its grotesque body shifting in a way that was almost human, yet completely unnatural. Its teeth gleamed in the fading light, but it didn't move to attack. Not yet. It was waiting for something, testing me. And then, out of sheer desperation, I did something stupid. I grabbed a nearby branch, lit it with the lighter I always carried, and waved the makeshift torch in the air. I don't know why I thought it would work. Maybe instinct, maybe panic. But to my surprise, the creatures recoiled, their bodies twitching as the light from the flame flickered over them. They weren't afraid, not really, but it seemed to confuse them, just enough to make them hesitate. I didn't waste time. With my legs screaming in pain and the fire blazing in my hand, I hobbled backward, keeping the torch between me and them. They followed, stalking me but never getting too close. My heart pounded in my ears, each step feeling like it could be my last. The edge of the ravine was close now, and with every ounce of strength I had left I scrambled up the steep incline, my fingers digging into the dirt and rocks as I pulled myself out. When I reached the top, I collapsed, panting, the torch still burning weakly beside me. The creatures had stopped at the base of the ravine watching, but they didn't climb after me. They just stood there, their misshapen forms barely visible in the darkness. I could feel their eyes on me, cold and calculating, but they didn't move. It was as if I had crossed some invisible line, one they weren't willing to follow. I lay there for a long time, unable to move, my leg bleeding, my mind spinning. I had lost Bear and I had barely escaped with my life. But more than that, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over. I had seen too much, stumbled into something I wasn't supposed to find. Those creatures, they were still out there, lurking, watching waiting for the next person to make the same mistake I had. Eventually, I managed to limp back to the cabin. I called the sheriff, told him what I'd found, but I didn't tell him everything. No one would believe me anyway. When the deputies arrived, they found the body in the ravine, just like I said, but no sign of the creatures. The bones were collected, examined, but there were no leads, no explanations. Officially, they chalked it up to an animal attack though no one could explain what kind of animal would do something like that. As for me, I packed up and left. I couldn't stay there, not after what I'd seen. I don't know where those things came from or what they are, but I know one thing for sure. They're still out there, and they're not going away anytime soon. 
and I've got nothing left but a rifle, a scar, and a memory of Bear to remind me that some places, no matter how remote, aren't meant for people. Maybe they never were. I had a simple life out in western Montana, living off the grid on a piece of land my father left me. I didn't need much, just a roof, some chickens, a solar setup, and a wood stove. It wasn't glamorous, but I liked the quiet. My name's Mason Herford, and this happened back in 97. You'd think being a logger most of my life would make me accustomed to the forest, but that was before, well, before all of this. I don't like talking about my past much, but I wasn't always this far removed from society. I'd spent a good chunk of my younger years in Bozeman, drinking away a pretty decent life. Got into a lot of fights, went through a marriage that lasted shorter than one of Montana's early springs, and somewhere along the line I figured I'd rather be left alone. So I built a cabin and left the rest of the world behind. I didn't own a gun, though, which surprises some folks. I never felt I needed one. Wolves and bears kept their distance, and the human types didn't come out this far unless they were lost or stupid. I figured I was good. Funny, isn't it? A guy like me, thinking he's prepared, living his life out here like he's invincible. Turns out there are worse things than wolves or bad weather. It started when a friend of mine, Jason Avery, one of the few people I kept in touch with, told me he wanted to come visit. We'd been logger buddies for years. He was one of the last to see me before I threw in the towel and moved out here. Said he was driving in from Wyoming, but his truck broke down somewhere near Helena. Asked if I could pick him up. Reluctantly, I agreed. I'm not much of a people person, even less of a drive-two-hours kind of guy, but Jason? He'd been good to me, so I figured I'd return the favor. It was a long drive, and the roads were winding and miserable, exactly what you'd expect from rural Montana. When I finally reached him, he was at this small, dingy gas station, looking about as out of place as a fish on land. He'd already had a few beers, his usual way of making bad situations better. You got a plan for getting that thing fixed, I asked, eyeing his truck. Not a damn clue, Mason, but I figure we'll deal with that tomorrow. You still got that spare room? I didn't, but I told him we'd figure it out. We made the drive back to my place mostly in silence, Jason nodding off in the passenger seat. I wasn't far from my cabin when I noticed something odd. There was an old dirt road I didn't remember ever seeing before. Now I know these woods. I've lived here for years, and I've walked every inch of the surrounding forest, but this road, it felt wrong. Ever seen that before? I asked Jason, pointing to the turnoff. He rubbed his eyes and squinted. Nah, but I ain't been around here much. Maybe it's new. There's nothing new out here, and that's what bugged me. Still, I brushed it off. I was tired and I didn't feel like driving us down some random road just because it gave me the creeps. I should have paid more attention to my gut. Instead, I headed straight to the cabin, figuring I'd deal with the weird road later. When we pulled up, everything seemed fine. My chickens were making their usual racket, and the trees stood as silent sentinels around the property. Jason unloaded his bags, and after some small talk, we called it a night. But sleep didn't come easy. Every time I closed my eyes, I kept thinking about that road. Something gnawed at me. I figured it was just the beer and the late night drive, so I eventually drifted off. Around two in the morning, I woke up to the sound of the chickens losing their minds. Now chickens aren't the smartest creatures, but they know when something's out of place. I grabbed a flashlight, figuring maybe a raccoon had gotten into the coop. Jason was already up when I stepped outside, looking as puzzled as I felt. You hear that? He asked. Yeah, I'm going to check it out. I didn't make it more than a few steps before I noticed something else. This awful smell, like something rotting. But it wasn't just coming from the coop. It was everywhere, hanging in the air like a blanket of death. Jason smelled it too. What the hell is that? He muttered. I don't know, but it ain't good. When I reached the coop, the chickens were alive, but they were all huddled together, crammed into the farthest corner like they were trying to get away from something. That's when I saw it. Something had torn the fencing clean apart. The wire wasn't just cut. It was ripped open, like something big had pushed through it. And on the ground. Blood. A lot of it. 
but no bodies. I crouched down, shined the light into the darkness beyond the coop, and that's when I saw tracks. Big ones. Too big to be a bear. Too wide to be a wolf. Jason, I called, keeping my voice steady. Get over here. He came over and looked where I was pointing. You ever seen tracks like that before? No, I said quietly, and I don't think I want to. Now, a sensible man might have packed up right then and there, but we didn't. Call it curiosity or plain stupidity, but we decided to follow the tracks. They led us deeper into the woods, away from the cabin. The deeper we went, the stronger the stench became, and soon, it felt like we were walking into a graveyard. Then we saw it. In a clearing, half hidden by tall grass, was a carcass. It looked like a deer, but it had been torn apart. The guts were spread out like something had played with it, almost arranged in a deliberate pattern. But it wasn't just the deer that stopped us cold. Beside it, there was a man's arm, severed, fresh, blood still oozing from the stump. Jason turned away, gagging. Jesus, Mason, what the hell? I didn't answer. I was staring at something else, movement just beyond the clearing between the trees. It was subtle at first, like a shadow too big to be real. But then it stepped forward and my blood ran cold. I couldn't tell you exactly what it was. It moved on four legs, but its body was twisted, like something had smashed an animal together with a human. It had the bulk of a bear, but its movements were too calculated, too controlled. And that smell, it was like it brought the stench with it the air around it thickening with decay. I've seen enough wildlife to know when something's off, but this thing? It was all wrong. Jason whispered, What the hell is that? We need to go, I replied, my voice barely above a whisper. But Jason, being Jason, wasn't having it. No way. We gotta kill it. He pulled a hunting knife from his pack like that'd be enough to stop whatever that thing was. I knew better. I grabbed his arm. We're leaving. Now. That's when it turned toward us. It didn't roar, didn't make a sound. It just started moving. Faster than anything that size should. I yanked Jason and we ran, crashing through the trees like idiots. Behind us I could hear it tearing through the underbrush, gaining on us. There was no time to think, no time to plan. We hit the dirt road near the cabin and Jason tripped, falling hard. I turned back and in the split second I hesitated. The thing was on him. It happened so fast. I barely had time to process it. One moment Jason was scrambling to his feet, the next he was screaming as the thing dug its claws into his back, ripping him open like a rag doll. Blood sprayed everywhere, and all I could do was run. I ran back to the cabin, locking myself inside. The thing didn't follow me. Maybe it was satisfied with what it had done. Maybe it just didn't care about me. Either way, I sat there in silence the sound of Jason's screams fading into the night. By morning, the woods were quiet again. I forced myself to go back out, back to the clearing where Jason had fallen. His body was there, torn to shreds but not dragged away. His eyes were wide open, frozen in terror, and the tracks around him were unmistakable. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't anything I'd ever seen before. But it had left its mark. I called the sheriff, of course, told him about the attack, about the tracks. They came out, took one look at Jason's body, and called it a bear attack. I didn't argue. Let them believe what they wanted. But I knew the truth. I still know it. Whatever that thing was, it's still out there, and it's not just killing for food. 